Welcome to a very special keynote for Unrolled Build broadcast and live events. It's the first event of its kind for Epic Games and we're excited to have you here. I'm Dana Kelly, Epic, and I'll be moderating this fireside with Joel Zimmerman, better known as Dead Mouse to most people. He's a world-renowned musician, producer, DJ, and entrepreneur. We are joined by Epic's Patrick Wombold, our solutions architect for broadcast and live events. So today we're gonna to talk about how technology is impacting music, entertainment, business, and culture. We'll also discuss where entertainment is headed in terms of how artists and how fans interact with brands and their experiences. So with that, I'd like to toss the first question to Joel. So you got into both music and programming early on. Can you talk a little bit about that and how those worlds started to merge for you? Um, well, it, it just kind of happened organically because it's the, as the, when I started out in music, like at the very beginning, it was all about, you know, the, the practical theory, uh, and playing an instrument, um, piano. And I, it took me a couple of years to realize I was really bad at it. Um, I didn't have the muscle memory or the, you know, you know what I mean? The thing that you need to be, to be a great instrument player. And this is pre computers being able to really excel at composing music. So that was, that was it. If you wanted to make music, you had to buy a guitar, a <laughs> piano or a saxophone or a tambourine. And um, I just I just didn't have it in me, but I had the, I, I wanted to make, I had the music in my head, but I just, you know, I was, I was brick walled by this inability to, to perform and record or whatever, that kind of thing. But uh, so uh, computers kind of came along at just the right time for me. And I, I like kind of grew up with, you know, the, the Amigas, the 486s, the Pentiums, and then the so on, so on. The, all that just started ramping up and up and up. So it's like, I, I also loved like digital media, making websites. Like I, you know, learned to, you know, I made my GeoCities page and stuff like that. And I was like, hey, great, this is, this is so awesome. Uh, computers are great. Uh, but also what about music? You know, uh, and, you know, computers then weren't the greatest. You, you didn't see a computer in a music studio, like a professional one. Anyway, they were still ADATs and stuff like that. So it just it came naturally for me. Um, and then like much later in my career, it's, uh, you know, the day job was doing programming and digital media and stuff like that. So it's like, you know, I worked for a, a T-shirt illustration company, whereas, you know, I would do these illustrations and renderings on computer uh, for their T-shirts. And then and then I was hired by um, an IT company that developed uh, sartorial instruments and technology where they did like suits and stuff like that. But they had a, a an IDE that we had to build in Flash uh, to, yeah. you know, measure a customer and all that stuff. So I was really big into the Flash scene. And then as motion graphics became a thing, um, motion graphics, I think, was basically coined when Flash came out because you never called an animated GIF motion graphics, you know, it was just a GIF or, or whatever. But, you know, Flash had that deliverable format, uh, that vector based format that was like you could stream on the Internet like super fast with our modem connections, at least. And uh, we could see, you know, these really cool things. So there were websites like, you know, too advanced to remember that Eric Jordan guy and uh, all these really cool MoGraph kind of websites and stuff like that. And you're thinking, wow, you know, this has the potential to be broadcast quality stuff, but I'm seeing it on a web page half in time. So I, I really dug into the, the flash community and then, you know, joined a few tribes and uh, attended uh, conferences like flash forward and stuff like that. And worked with a lot of really great companies that uh, did this thing. So, as that was going, Flash also lent itself, um, you know, an area where I could also add computer generated music to it, right? Because I had audio. So it, it warranted me still being able to have my hobby and make music and stuff like that. So every every website in the world had a Flash intro at one point in the history of the internet. And believe it or not, there was a company that actually did quite well supplying companies with Flash intro music. And so it was a stock loop library website that I worked for called Killer Sound. Uh, and they were based in Poly Alto. So I was a full-time composer for the first time in my life making music for flash intros, right? Like try explaining that to your mom in the late nineties. You know, <laughs> like, what do you do? Well, I make, I make flash loops. What? Well, wait, whoa, 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 hold up. Yeah. So, uh, we did, I did that for a while and then, then I realized, wow, wait, <laughs> there's money to be made making music that isn't being, uh, you know, a, a top selling artist and stuff like that. And this, this is amazing because I also love web development and motion graphics and stuff like that. So um, I, w I was my own go to guy when I noticed a lot of my friends like, uh, you know, in, uh, Air, Air Jordan and uh, PlayStation, and all these guys ha had these great visual pieces, but they had no music. And I thought, well, haha, I got the one up. If I can learn to be that good 
then I can, you know, use my own music and all that stuff. And I don't have to worry about, you know, licensing or, or doing some really weird yeah. thing. And, and that went on for many years uh, as I like just honed in on my skills on motion graphics, whether they're 3D, 2D, whatever. Uh, and uh, same with the music. And I just decided to wait and see which one kind of took off. And I guess music one, but... <laughs> 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 my first online gaming experience was like quake or something like that uh with some you know laggy laggy whatever but it was like i would play it like all night all day and then like in and when you put it in comparison to like the demands or the ass of the average game player now that wants that you know 22 sec millisecond ping right i was happy to get like you know <laughs> two seconds you know uh, right. in quake and stuff like that but what really got my goat was it's like wow this game look <laughs> quake looks amazing um but it's being drawn in real time like i don't need to render this i don't, I don't need to like you know draw this frame by frame in uh photoshop or however means of cg there was and i'm thinking you know one day this is going to be you know something that this is how we're going to experience a tv show where so we can walk around the set and see this and see that from like all you these unique perspectives like multiplayer tv shows kind of things and i've always had that in the back of my mind obviously but not thinking that you know oh i'm going to be producing shows when i'm older um but now that it's come full circle and and then when you know the kind of budget warranted the kind of look you need content and the the way traditionally at least i know in edm and you know electronic music or most concerts in general are, are all very, very, very signpost shows. They have a set list. And, and so that means that the content can be whatever. Like it's just, it could film some of it. They could render a lot of it. And it's all rosterized. And, and, and meanwhile, like, so I'm going to Joe EDM show and I'm watching it. And I'm like, that's cool. But, and then I get home and I play like, Fortnite or, or something <laughs> and I'm watching these graphics being produced that look millions of times better It's running at 144 frames a second. You're thinking why can't that be the content? You know, um, it, it looks great It's it's production Quality render stuff running at real time. Why aren't people using this more in live entertainment and, and broadcast and stuff like that? And they are they are it's just mm -hmm. so far and few between because every every show that I've gone to I see this guy with a Resolume laptop. And he's playing clips, like he's a jazz musician up there. And I'm like, I mean, yeah, it works, but it's not very synchronous. It's not, it's not cohesive. But, you know, I always have these internal battles into my head where it's like, do the people know? The audience, you know what I mean? You know, like, would it, it really blow It depends on which show you're going to, right? You know, yeah, I, I think people that go to your show have a different expectation, right? You know, well, but if you're going to see, uh, I'm not going to name any artists, no. but top 40 artists, right? You're basically paying to see them, right? Yeah. <laughs> in a lot of ways. So. Yeah. So there's definitely some arguments that run in my mind where it's like, you know, even for my own show where I'm creating this and then you have to kind of meet this threshold and then at least try to stay just one or 20 notches above it is, does anyone even care? And the, the big one for me is that me, do I care? Yes, a thousand percent. So I'm always 10 notches over par in that department. And I, I think that's maybe what does it for, you know, people talking about my production because I'm, I, of course I'm out there to impress the audience and impress the crowd and, and do all that stuff. But kind of, I'm like, I'm low key wanting to get people at like, moment factory impressed you know and the, the guys at front of house or the the neck beards like you know oh he's, he's using yeah. a ma three and ma two mode you know like those are yeah. th those are my people you know what i mean like of course uh, so uh, we're the worst critics you know like yeah. I, can't go to a sh I can't go to a show with my like production friends because they will just like pick it apart i'm like dude i'm trying to enjoy this. yeah I would, I, 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 same for me for every and one of my all-time asked questions in any interview as just this dead mouse oh so what music do you listen to i'm like i can't i can't because like it's i don't i i'm like i'm thinking like oh that sounds great how did he do this how did he do that and it's like i don't yeah. enjoy music like people consume music or enjoy music it's very different for me just yeah. like going to a show and and i'm probably the same as you i'll go to a show and you know i'm looking first at rigging Bang. and then product and then scalers and you know kind of taking a peek in the front of house going oh you know Folsom oh, oh, that's course. cute you know and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it feels like you also do a lot of storytelling with your music you know you've been using unreal for a while I mean when did you start experimenting with it 
Um, I think Unreal came out of my necessity for a suite mm. that did all the things I want to do that will have mm. a sustainable end product, whether it's the output for a show or a video game or a production tool. Like Unreal is all three of those things for me. So that was a big turn on for me. And um, we have seen things like there are other technologies that I do use in my show, like Touch Designer, for example, it's a great data handler, renderer for you know 2D graphics and movie playback systems, a very, very programmatic modular way to design it, a very custom show. But it lacks in that kind of um, deliverable yep. uh, end of it. So it's like at the end of the day, I've got this, I've got this TD project that I, to this day, have been working on for like about two, three years. It's only about two meg, but it's two megs of just Python and code and, and this and that and operators and uh, GLSL and all this stuff. And you're thinking like, my show fits on a floppy disk. It's a real <laughs> shame I can't compile this into an executable and give it out to my fans so they can fly around my TD scene with TD's lackluster renderer, you know? Um, and, you know, and I'm like, I, you know, and Unreal is that. Yeah. But there's always something that you can, you know, do externally that then make it work inside UE. That's the good thing. And the, the big turn on about UE is that now that I'm doing like these virtual show productions or previs, for example, is a big one. My first experiment with UE was, okay, so since I model all my stuff for my content, like I, I've modeled my stage, but not, not in every little screw and truss rig, I would just do the lights uh, and the UV surfaces for, for, the, for the video content. And I would do it in 3D space so I could show my engineer, build that, you know, uh, bring that into Vectorworks and make that a, a reality. And then he'll finesse it up, engineer it to the point where it's like physically possible and send it back and then be like, oh, okay, well, here's basically what you wanted, um, if not exactly or whatever. And uh, here's your video surface layout, right? And then traditionally what they would do is we would spend $10,000 a day to rent a massive warehouse and break you know in VER or Patrick or, and everyone else you know under the sun to come watch me play with my new toys you know and uh, and and as cool as that is and that's the way you'd have to do it you'd have to go to Tate you'd have to go or do it yourself at yeah. some big warehouse and you'd spend about 10 grand a day at bare minimum for crew coffee McDonald's uh, you know all the all the rentals and <laughs> and people and, and stuff like that and it's a big deal and you only get like a week or two depending and you know all the lights are on all the powers on you got smoke machines in and, and your LDs have about a week to program your stuff and it usually gets done mm. I'm not complaining but for like 80 grand you know mm. like just for that you're like that's that's a lot of money what I decided I was like there's just no way video games are so great right now like I should just be able to import this model and turn some things on, make some emissives that aren't gonna be like, you know, ooh, volumetrically perfect. And uh, cause I know that my LD would be like, well, where's the fog? Where's the haze? Where's the, you know, and I need to see the beam and stuff like, like in some cases, I'm like, well, you kind of know what that's gonna look like, you know, on a stage. So let's just get this model in, turn some lights on and then make a player controller that can move around the scene. And then I can pipe in content. And then I did that with Unreal Engine just by using uh, the enumerating a video capture device uh, a data path uh, and then I would pump in my content and then play it and then show it on the surfaces and then I'd be able to move the camera around and then just you know my manager who doesn't really know much about you know show production or anything he's just blown away he's like oh that's great. that's <laughs> real time like I'm like yeah yeah it's just rendering on the fly because in his mind rendering means 30 seconds of frame because he's used to me, you know, struggling with Octane. Complaining and, you know. about that in another form. For <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, why so, is it rendering so long? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it became the ultimate previs tool because there were all these like previs suites for MA and, and, and all these like other different ones. But the commonality was underneath them all, they were all game engines. So they were either done in Unreal or they were done in Unity. Uh, and I'm thinking like, well, why use this one that kind of does an okay job when you can just actually use the thing and then because you've built that layer if you want later to release it as a client like the uh, distributable you could totally do that so i was like hmm i better learn this stuff uh because this is uh this is the future and then lo and behold two years later you guys are using it for tv commercials xr stages the mandalorian stuff uh all the motion capture stuff and it's just tools on tools on tools being you know thrown into this you know this big ide that just does it all yeah. to some degree or less in some cases but it's all there and if it's not there 
Well, you got C++ to make it there, you know? So, you know, with, with touring being out of the picture over the last year, you know, Joel, wh- where have you found creative inspiration? What have you been working on? Um, well, I've been working on this, like, as I've just dubbed it, uh, Oberhasli, which is basically me taking the previous tools that I've always used and polishing them up, making them look pretty, adding thematic events and stuff like that, and throwing it in Unreal Engine. And, and I'm hopefully looking to turn it into a packaged experience that is uh, downloadable and executable from anyone. So they could just, you know, enjoy a show. Like, uh, imagine the, the, well, the Travis Scott thing in Fortnite kind of thing, but just the mouse version of that and that's it. It's hitting it on, on two ends. It's whereas I'm trying to make it as accurate as I can to my show for the sake of my previs. So that way I can run my show and see my lights and do my stuff. And I can actually use that program to author my damn show. So when the lights turn back on and we get back out there, uh, I've got, you know, content ready to go that I didn't have to, you know, build a rehearsal studio and all this stuff. I could just kind of schlep it together in Unreal. But then the idea is to kind of pretty it up. And there was a real, real gold rush uh, for those kind of events uh, early last year remember that it's like yeah. everybody wanted the virtual yeah. set or the virtual program and, and a lot of shortcuts were taken to put it generously um you know to kind of do that kind of thing so they would build a set in ue but then they would put this like doom 2d sprite <laughs> of the actor in there of video footage and stuff like that and you're like yeah i mean that's cool it's the virtual set that's really grabbing me right now and not so much there's a bit of a disconnect between having a, a doom sprite for a human you know behind a, a dj thing you know and then um because obviously it's it would be very time consuming to create a rigged and mobile capped character that can be turned on and and ready to go at a moment's notice to do that thing. So I thought that's what I need to work on because this has to be immersive. I have to be able to take the camera, go behind him, go to the side of him, go to this, and he's the avatar and stuff like that. But then we also have to incorporate live video to break the illusion that this isn't just a playback show uh, in a video game. It's all being ingested live. So um, I, th- I think we were one of the first to do the the Xsends live for like an hour and a half and uh, be able to pull that off in just exclusively with Unreal Engine and uh, the Live Link plugin. And then I had video in jest. I had live chat feed in jest and all that stuff too to make a truly like live show. But but the only the only drawback was is that the for me at the end of the day it was a video stream. So like I would have loved to have had a distributable client out there so that everybody could download the client and like for like a gig or something like that and then open the client and then wait for the show to start and then boom there I am but that's when you delve into the infinite hell that is like you know net code and server propagation and all that stuff because you need all these instances running for people to connect to and all that stuff and i'm not at that level i'm just kind of like let's get it working on LAN, <laughs> and i'll let someone else deal with the the net code and the all the server services that we need to run it and all that stuff too and, and obviously fortnite was the first to do it because you guys definitely have the horsepower on the internet to kind of you know have that much concurrency uh in a in a game as you've proven the last few years um so that was that was really cool to watch and, and be a part of even though we were i think for our show we we just ingested uh, rtmp with a like an eight second delay or something like that but i'm i'm really looking forward to seeing more than just video feed where protocols are coming across and midi data or dmx data or uh character rigs uh and motion capture and stuff like that for for live um client side events the thing that it's it's like this gray cloud that hangs over my head is like i'm at the mercy of this you know because it, and i don't mean that like oh i feel like there's an impending threat i just mean that i'm at the mercy of this as in i know nothing about making a game engine but i the the one thing i do know is it takes 20 years to make a good one <laughs> and billions of dollars you know so the, you know every time i'm thinking like i'm gonna write a game engine, a rudimentary game engine in touch designer or in C or something like that, where I can just draw these 3D primitives. I'm like back where Carmack was in the nineties. And that is like my best effort. And and that was his best effort back in the day too, you know? So to see the evolution of this, of thousands of hands and, um, and minds that have went into the development of this game engine and billions of dollars and, you know, millions of hours, uh, you know, and then it's just like, well, this is the gold standard 
weird. I mean, it's like we're locked into this language. It's like you've invented a language, literally, like English or French or Dutch or something like that, where it's like you have to subscribe to this. You have to onboard it. You can't just make remember Esperanto. <laughs> you know, yep. you can't just do that anymore. <laughs> they no. tried. But <laughs> Well, it's you know, and it's it's interesting because like I mean, obviously I think I've always postulated this too. Like, what if I had to try and write like the I you know, the operating system <laughs> like like for something on my own and I'm like <clears throat> this is just the thought of it's like daunting. So of course you're like, nah, we'll just use the one that, you know, seems ubiquitous, right? You know, hopefully, right. hopefully Unreal will be ubiquitous as far as creative tools, because that's what we'd like to see, you know, just like, hey, like, it'll just be the natural choice that if you want to do something, yeah. like, yeah, let's Oh, do yeah, yeah, I've used it, I've used it from, like, again, previs to now I'm, I'm working on my own game, distributable game client, and then the other fun thing that I've, I've recently discovered with uh, Unreal over the last, like, two years is using it as a renderer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, like build beautiful things, you know, because you're getting that um, instant feedback on lighting and, and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and you, even if you put your all you, you put all your volumetric settings, your light maps, you just put everything on stun, you're still less than a second per frame for render. So, yeah, OK, 10 FPS. I mean, it's sure a lot faster than a PBR renderer in a 3D <laughs> app or, you know, with all the ray casting and all that stuff. And uh, I've done I've done NFTs that way. I actually just uh, did a, an NFT with Res and I did it in Unreal Engine. I just threw all the settings on Epic and then even went under the, you know, I went into the sea of airs and multiplied those by 10. And I'm like, wow, this is like a PBR render and it's basically coming in at 30 FPS. But, you know, I'm going to I'm going to render it. I'm going to use the um, movie render cube. Oh, yes, so, thank you. so are you are you using the not not the old one? Hopefully. Yeah, no, I, I did use the old one, uh, and it worked. Look, it worked. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, so you're building your interactive 3D experience with Unreal. You just made your first NFT with Unreal, and you announced a startup recently. Oh, uh, Pixel Links. Yeah. So uh, Pixel Links is kind of let's just call it the agency between the digital creator that are using all these tools to the connect to the games. And we love to use the word metaverse. I hate it. it I just cringe so hard when they say the metaverse because the metaverse isn't. It's like the, they're these little mini verses. And all of the mini verses together maybe make the metaverse, but there's no interconnect between the mini verses. So the the NFT scene has been absolutely crazy with with the hype. Uh, but as we know, with comes hype comes gross negligence and ignorance to technology, <laughs> right? So I was like, oh, 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 and you can make your avatar, and you you can put it in this game or that game or that game, and I'm like. No, you can't. You really can't. Um, there is no way for me to take, you know, my character rig and stuff and blueprints and, and things that I've created in textures in Unreal and then just load it in Unity. It doesn't work like that, you know, or or the closed engine or the, uh, you know, uh, there's there's really no maybe, maybe, maybe if we can get our, every company in the world to agree on a certain blockchain technology to pull basic data like texture and geometry and that's it like FBX level mm. stuff on the blockchain that's the only w truly interchangeable kind of format that I could see but then you would need to have your game or your product or whatever have that kind of parsing ability to take that FBX and then massage the data that works best yeah. for that engine and stuff so that's on the engine side mm. to then you know translate that and then have that appear in your game and stuff like that with like a rasterized texture image that's like 1024 by 1024 yeah no problem okay we can do that but when you start talking about avatars and then now you have to connect those avatars to player controllers uh, or you know the other engines and stuff like that that use different you know i i love that uh immovable ladder <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's what that is so uh pixel links is basically we're going to be the interim to delegate between the developers using whatever engine to the artist, uh, because the artist, you get them, they're, they're digital artists. They, they work in Photoshop, they work in Illustrator, they work here and there, and they or, or they work in 3D, uh, but they don't use any programmatic language or stuff like that. They just do hard surface modeling and stuff like that and texturing and stuff like that. Few know the routes and roads they need to take to get their stuff in a game engine. We do. We employ people who do. And um, we are going to act as that kind of agency to basically round up oh the blancos team the this and that team the guys who were built this game and unreal team and stuff like that and then we act as that kind of inter interim between you know commerce and what they wanted how they're working their layers and stuff like whether it's blockchain or not and and getting those 
tribes of digital artists who are really great at doing one things because like i said i could i could model my stage and have it look beautiful in in cinema 4d and then i'd be like yeah this is awesome now to get this in unreal that well that's a different story you know because yeah. now you're dealing with lod's you're dealing with textures you're dealing with optimizations and yeah. mechanics and movements and animation and interactivity and all that stuff so that's like tenfold the work uh, in a completely different area. And we can't expect artists to just be able to create all this great digital art and then just, whoop, you know, file, import art. <laughs> hey, it's in the game. You know, it doesn't work like that. So we're going to act as an agency to bridge between the artist and uh, the game development communities and stuff like that. Awesome. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, That's is there anything not. else you would like to share with us, you know, in, in terms of how we can keep up with your work? Oh, uh, geez. What's next? Not, just follow me around on the internet. I guess I, I don't really have a, a creative, a single hub. Like I'll, I'll stream my stuff on Twitch from time to time, but mm -hmm. Twitch isn't my business. So I don't care to promote it either. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it's, yeah. it's kind of more of a fan yeah. things, but uh, as we do, when we do polish things up and we, we get them into a releasable state, of course, we're just going to blow everything up. Uh, yeah. And um, you know, the, the guys over at the mega grant team <laughs> have been way up my butt about like, huh, where are you? How have you done what, what do you need uh, uh, where's it at then i actually just wrote this big okay here's where we're at you know it's mm -hmm. not done but we have this done this done this done this done and this is coming it's coming it's coming so like when that day comes where i can get that package built mm -hmm. and compiled and it runs nicely on every gpu imaginable and has all the data encapsulated in there so it's like uh, like because i mean i could distribute it now the only problem is is you need an m8 to run it <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, you, you buy a 80,000 yeah. desk it comes free with the game yeah joel patrick thank you so much for your time unreal build attendees we hope you've enjoyed this fireside chat and we'll see you next time thank you cool yeah.